Hi, my name is Ed Amar, and thank you so much to the Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival for inviting uh, myself and Tara Laskowski today. Um, I've known Tara for years, and I'm such a fan of her work and a fan of her personally. You would not know that from our social media interactions, <laughs> where all we do is antagonize each other. But we, uh, but I consider her uh, one of my closest friends in writing and outside of writing. Um, she considers me an acquaintance. But we have a uh, little interview planned, and then we have kind of a fun Q and A after that with um, stuff writers wish they'd known um, prior to getting published. So we'll start. But first, uh, Tara, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm. Tara Laskowski, and um, I had my debut novel, One Night Gone, um, come out last, no wait, it was not last October, <laughs> last year, I like erased last year, um, October 2019, um, and it won the Agatha, the McCavity, and the Anthony Award, which was awesome, um, and I've also had two short story collections published, uh, Bystanders and Modern Manners for Your Inner Demons. Um, and my second novel is due out this October. It's called The Mother Next Door. Um, so yes, and Ed and I have known each other for a long time and we do really have affection for each other even though we make jokes all the time on Facebook. I, I said really nice things and you said have affection for each other. So <laughs> that's fine. Um, and my name is Ed Amar. Uh, I write under E.A. Amar and E.A. Bars to make it just more confusing for readers to find my books. I want to keep you on your toes. Um, my last book, uh, They're Gone, came out last year. And uh, before that, my novel, The Unrepentant, came out in 2019. And it was nominated for the uh, Anthony Award. In addition, I also uh, write columns for the Washington Independent review of books and I host uh, DC's uh, Noir at the Bar series which has gone virtual much as everything else is. In fact we're virtual right we're just computer animations at this point. Yes pretty much. So uh, you know I want to start with a real um, basic question uh, easy one to answer. How did you start One Night Gone? Did it start with an idea, character, something else? And um, please provide your answer in a way that everybody can copy it and use that uh, for their own success. <laughs> um, the book, I started the book with the idea of wanting to write about a house that was very beautiful on the outside, but kind of had a creepy vibe on the inside. And that is like literally what started this. And then I had to think about like, that I, the fact that I have to write 300 pages and I can't just describe the house all the time. <laughs> so that evolved into the book, which is, um, it's a, it basically, it's essentially a cold case mystery where a uh, character, my character, Allison is investigate. She, she goes to this beautiful beach house um, to house it. And while she's there, she starts hearing the stories of this teenage girl that went missing in the town about 30 years before. Um, and so she starts investigating what happened to the girl. Um, and the house that she stays in definitely has some creepy vibes to it. So, you know, it's, that's still there, but really the story is not that, I guess. So yeah, that's where it started from. I mean, what about you? Like, where do you, do you get your ideas from like specific things or do they just- This isn't sort of about me, together? Tara, this is about you. <laughs> No. Um, it's a conversation, Ed. <laughs> I'm hanging up. Uh, I generally with me, it might be a scene more that I think about that kind of interests me or intrigues me. Kind of like you said, I guess, with the image of the house. I'll get an image of, of somebody in a certain situation and then go from there. Either that or, or a character. You know, yeah. uh, somebody yeah. that kind of intrigues me that I want to write about. Um, yeah, and they sort of the story comes from them, although they're usually fairly different uh, by the by the end of the book. Um, it's it, I think it's interesting because I have heard a lot of people say that you sort of need like a what if scenario when you start a book, like like a high concept kind of like what if you won the lottery but you're 
identity is secret or, you know, something like that. And like, and then go from there. And I have never been able to come up with any kind of high concept question. It's, yeah. It's the elevator pitch, right? I mean, it's so, right. I, I, I'm so envious of writers who do that because I don't, I can't do that either. I can't give a really good close-knit summary of a book that is going to be, you know, that, that is immediately engrossing. I mean, I think, you know, you get down to writing that pitch, but I, it's something that usually comes to me after the book when I, when yeah. I'm working on how to promote it or talk about it. Yeah. But there's certain, certain writers that are so good at that. Like Sophie Hanna is great. Alan Orloff is even, he's like the way he talks about his books. I'm like, Oh, I immediately want to read that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and I'm like and, rambling on for like five minutes. <laughs> well, yeah, it's like uh, Adrian McKinty's The Chain, you know, that yes. came out and it was about, uh, if, for those who aren't familiar with it, it was about uh, your, I, I think like your child was kidnapped and to get your child back, you had to kidnap somebody else's child or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's so immediately intriguing. And yeah, no, my, mine are all like, well, there's this guy and he, he does some bad stuff. And then stuff happens. <laughs> please, please, please buy it. <laughs> so it was- Or are you uh, like, or are you uh, like philosoph philosophical, like, like um, philosophical, like, well, it's about the way that things intersect with the women's communication. <laughs> Person's eyes are glazing over. So was this the, uh, was One Night Gone the first novel you wrote? Um, no, I had two other novel manuscripts that I wrote. I, I wrote one for um, my thesis at George Mason when I was getting my MFA at George Mason University. Go Patriots. Um, and none, none of, neither of those went anywhere. So they sat, but they were, they were not in the mystery crime genre. Like the, the thesis I wrote was, um, like, I guess you would call it women's fiction, like women's historic fiction. I don't know. It was like a historic love story. It's like over 500 pages long, crazy. Yeah. Took me like seven years to write it. And then I realized it was not what I should be writing. So, um, but I, I honestly think two novels is not really dramatic. I mean, I feel like I've heard from a lot of writers who've written six, seven, eight novels that before they find the one that actually sticks but gets published or whatever. Yeah, same here. I mean, I think it was my third book that got published, and I, uh, I, you know, I, I have friends who are you know terrific writers who've written seven or eight books ahead of time and they're like yeah you know I'm like how do you even do that I would feel so depressed <laughs> I hope they're not watching. no 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 I mean no no they're 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 writing more books <laughs> um they're also really prolific so maybe it's just kind of their thing you know like two two books a year kind of kind of people maybe yeah. I don't know um so you'd mentioned in your intro that you also wrote two collections of short stories. Do your um, short stories, which are great, by the way, and everybody should check out Bystanders and Modern Manners for Your Inner Demons. I love those books. And my question is, do you, um, do you approach, uh, do, you, do you find a significant difference in how you approach the beginning of a novel to the beginning of a short story? Yeah, I mean, it's a totally different process, right? I mean, you probably know this as well. Like, for me, they're completely different animals. And I think that I'm actually, I feel like I was more, I, I'm more of a short fiction person. Um, I yeah. edited a flash fiction journal for many years, and I just love that form. Like, I just, I don't know, I feel like I, my, my strength is more in like these short scenes and like really getting into a description rather than trying to like navigate a whole plot is very scary to me. Um, and since I've started writing novels, it's really the thing that I have to concentrate on. Like I, I feel like when I was writing really, really short pieces, I could write one, sit, let it sit for a day or two weeks, whatever, and come back to it. But when I um, started writing novels, I got really, I had to get really disciplined about it. Like I have to write every day 
which I never was like a write every day kind of person, but in order to keep it in my head in any sort of way and understand like what I'm doing, I have to check in with it every day, which is weird. It's a different process for me than writing short fiction. So, and I feel like um, I haven't quite figured out my process for like how to begin, like, because I think that everything is different. Like even short stories, like every short story is different. Like we were just talking about where sort of ideas come from. And sometimes with a short story, it all just like is there. And I'm like, this is a story that I'm gonna write this. And obviously like I have to figure out little things along the way, but I pretty much can see like the whole arc, but I can't do that with novels as much. And my when I wrote One Night Gone, I didn't really outline it. Like I really just started kind of writing and seeing what happened. And, and then when I got about halfway through, I thought, okay, this is a mess. I really need to sit down and figure out where it's going, what am I doing? Um, but then when I was trying to sell my second book, they wanted like an outline. So I had to work with my editor and my agent on like on a synopsis, which I'd never done before. And it was really painful. And it took probably a month or two to do it. And then I thought, this is golden, right? I've got this roadmap now and all I got to do is sit here and like fill it in and write it and I'm good. I don't have to be meandering through all the stuff. And so I did, I wrote the whole thing according to the outline and then we ended up throwing out the whole, whole book and I had to start over. So I'm not an outliner, I'm not an outliner. So is, um, one thing I wanted to ask you is, uh, are you, with the second book is that you're pretty much at the tail end of all the editing, right? So we can talk about it without causing any kind of existential pain. I am not quite at the end of the editing of it yet, but I have to be in a month. So I have a month left. Man. So I am still extremely stressed. Yeah, I can't imagine it. Well, if I only had a month to finish a book, I can't imagine taking time out to do an interview now when you could be writing and... Well, I'm writing yeah. as we talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, was there a difference with... So with your first book, you were... When you wrote One Night Gone, you were unagented. You weren't under contract. Um, it yeah. seems to me like, you know, knowing you at the time, it was kind of a uh, a gamble in a way, right? To see if you could move from short fiction to novels, um, which was something, not an experiment, something you wanted to do, but still a, a gamble. Now with your second book, your, you know, your first book got a lot of accolades, you know, well-deserved accolades. Uh, you're, um, you're under contract for your second. Did that change your approach to writing? Did it change your, in any way, like your psychology towards uh, towards the novel. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was really hard for me. Um, I'm I'm like a control freak, kind of high functioning anxiety person, and so um, to have a deadline was really really rough for me. And I think it messed a bit with my creative creativity, which is why I think I didn't recognize when I was writing to this outline that it was not quite working. And I was so concerned about like, well, I, I sold this book on this outline. I can't, I can't change it now, you know, and, and my, and this has been approved and this is what we came up with. So I have to keep writing to it. And so I ignored that like creative voice, whatever little thing it was screaming, like, this is not right, this isn't working. Um, and I regret that because ended up like the, the book that I am right, like the, the book that's coming out is like totally different. Like there is hardly anything that was in that original outline that is still, except for like the setting, it's still set on this cul-de-sac in this neighborhood and it's and it involves moms, but that's really about the only thing. And so that was like a really big learning experience for me that I need to be more vocal about where it's going, like, you know, being able to change it and stuff. I think um, and then when the pandemic hit, that messed up things too. So it was, it was, it's been a very, very difficult process to write this book. I don't think that's something that is unusual though, right? For writers to 
uh, diverge a bit from the submitted synopsis or proposal as the writing. I mean, I think editors almost, you know, expect that a little. I guess I didn't know that. And I wish yeah. I had known that, you know, cause I had never obviously had that experience before as to like what this is like. And I was like, I don't want to deviate from it so much that they're like, we didn't buy this book, you know? And so right. it was not, it was not something that I had thought was an option, which is odd because my editor is like super awesome. And I could have very easily bounced ideas off her, but I just, I didn't. So yeah. One thing I, so I sent you, you know, I, uh, I sent you a list of questions and I'm going to totally deviate from that. Um, so I'm sorry. I hope people like uh, awkward silence and a lot of pondering over questions and answers <laughs> because you mentioned a couple of things I want to ask about that I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, your relationship with your editor, is that, uh, what's that like? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really curious because I, I was talking to a friend of ours who got a new editor and it's a complete different dynamic than the one this friend used to have um mm -hmm. and you know the that that uh relationship is something that you know throughout like literary history it has been remarked upon the the closeness of an editor and a writer what's your relationship yeah. like um i love her she's amazing and i am i feel like fortunate every day that that we found each other, I guess. Um, her name's Melanie Freed and she's at, with Graydon House, which is an imprint of Harlequin. Um, and, you know, the one thing I like about her and also our agent, because Ed and I have the same agent, uh, Michelle Richter. The one thing I love about both of them is that they're so quick to respond, which yeah. is such a rare thing apparently in this business. But like, I can, I can email my editor in fact, I emailed her this past Monday, so it was President's Day, and I, you know, she had the day off, I had the day off, but I was writing, and I sent her a big chunk of my book, and I was like, I know you have the day off, I'm just sending this to you because I need it to go away, <laughs> I just don't want to look at it right now, um, you know, so whenever you get to it, and within like two hours, I think, she'd sent me back it with like line edits and you know, we discussed a couple things over email and I yelled at her for working on her day off, but she's just like really great about that. And she's really good about sort of calming me down when I freak out and also um, really smart about editing, like about making my book better. Cause I have, I, both of us, I think, come, come from this literary fiction background, right? And so my tendency is to be, like, I don't, I don't really want, I, well, there's two things. I don't want bad things to happen to my characters because I love them and I have a hard time making bad things happen to them. But I also don't focus so much on the movement. I'm like, in like, I get in this like, oh, I love this description of this beautiful thing. And, and so in, I want some of that in there, obviously, because that's how I write, but I also need to make sure that it's like, it's a suspense novel, right? So it has to feel suspenseful. It has to feel like it's moving. And so she's really, really good at putting those kinds of things in perspective and telling me sort of where things are going off or whatever. So, and, you know, so, you, you know, I was, I was thinking about that, that exact thing, your, your prose and how uh, careful uh, a writer you are. Um, the one thing I've always liked about your your writing, one of the things is that it's very careful, but it's also very raw. I I, I love how you do that. It, it's it's got this sense of um, of control, but under the surface, you, it, it's not even under the surface. It's like rippling right above it the whole time, and it's uh, the this the sense of tension. Um, I I just admire it so much. And one of the things that I was wondering about, you know, when you, when you departed from your first, um, from the first version of this book, I suppose, or the, the, the version that was on the outline, was yeah. any of that salvageable? Did it make it into this book, given what I'm going to assume, you know, how, how tight the prose was? Um, it was, it's like a completely different story. So, 
Uh, not very much of it, but yeah, there were pieces of it that I was able to kind of pull in, in different ways, but most of it, no, it was very tragic. If we had talked in April, I would have been weeping right now because <laughs> it, was, it was bad. I mean, I, I was actually seriously considering just being like, okay, um, let's just here, take this advance money back and I'll just move to Hawaii and become like a mail carrier and never think about writing again. Cause I can't do this. So I don't, I don't know if there's a, like a big demand for mail carriers in Hawaii. See, I would have failed at that too. Yeah. I mean, it would have been, <laughs> you would have got there and been like, well, we're, we're going on the here. beach. And be like, we get mail. I mean, like Hawaii, twice a though, week. So something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's where I thought about moving if the election had gone uh, differently. Yeah. I don't um, know. Anyway, it's so tough. I wanted to ask too. Um, you know, I, I I've read I've read all your short stories, and I and I read one I got. I haven't read the new book yet, but what do you consider the central theme of your work? And do you have one? I mean, do you think you if you you know, I had to describe yourself. Like I always think about, I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'll let you answer the question. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit. Um, I, I always think about uh, our friend, Jennifer Hillier, who describes herself as a writer of, you know, dark psychological thrillers. And that's her wheelhouse. You know, that's just where she and inha- her books all fit there. And it, and it's a natural fit. You know, it's not the right. kind of thing she has to force. Like she's like, well, people want me to write, you know, I, I'm, seeing that romantic suspense sells better. So I'm shoehorning into that. No, this is just what she does. And the market is speaking to her right now and it's, it's doing well for her. Yeah. So do you, do you have a, a theme to your work and do you have kind of a, an idea of who you are as a writer? Um, you know, I know, you, I feel, I've seen you talk about this before too, like, you know, what is our brand kind of question and like, what do we do? And um, and like we talked about before about being able to summarize our actual book plot into a cool sentence. Like I have a really hard time doing that with my writing as well. Um, you know, like my short story collection bystanders, I had like a thing. I was like, these are stories about what like, what happens to you when something bad happens to someone else? And that idea of like the ripple effect of violence and how like a violent act occurs, but then there's all this like aftermath that happens. And like, I find that really interesting, you know, like how you can be affected by something tragic that's happening to somebody else. Um, But I don't know that that's like really, because in my novels, the bad stuff's often happening to the main characters um and I don't know that I would say violence really because my books aren't particularly violent but there are definitely like themes that crop up a lot you know like I like like I like to write I never considered myself very good at writing setting and yet I feel like my stuff is like very atmospheric these days like it has to be set in a place that I can describe in creepy ways <laughs> because the setting to me, like, I don't know where you are can be so oppressive and interesting and affect like the way people see stuff. So I like to bring setting into it a lot. And um, I like to write a lot about like how the past, like how we can't escape our pasts and how like things come back to haunt you if you don't like deal with them in the right way. So. Those are some things, I guess. That, I mean, that's really long for a business card. You would need the front and the back. <laughs> yeah, really. I just hand a pamphlet out. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> um, I'm really fun at parties. <laughs> but do you, um, you know, do you, since you've been writing uh, novels and you're writing them every day, have you been able to, do any short fiction? Do you miss it if if uh, if you haven't? Um, I did. I've done a few uh, a few short stories. Like I have a short story coming out in the the next um, Sisters in Crime Chesapeake chapter anthology. Uh, that's about like there was like crime stories based on magic, um, and so I wrote that. Um, 
And uh, my husband, Art Taylor, and I wrote a story together that we now can't publish anywhere because it's based on Clue and there's copyright right. issues. That's right. But we had a lot of fun doing it. So hopefully like at some nowhere at the bar at some point we can like read it. And as long as there's not a Hasbro copyright person in the audience, we shouldn't get in trouble. Where did the copyright violation occur? In Tara and Mus Tara and Art's house. <laughs> with the what? with with the pen. I'm thinking about it in oh, clue terms. Got it. got it. Yeah, got it. We'll took, edit it that, took me a minute. We'll edit that part out and just put <laughs> it in part of not, it and just put in something of you laughing. That was like, that was like a dad that, joke. No, no, it well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had other questions. Um <laughs> but wait. Maybe yeah. we should move to the next segment. No, man, we got five more minutes. Really? Yeah. Why are you bouncing? Sick attacking. You're kind of like doing this. Oh, I'm on one of those. Are those you on like a ball chair? Yeah, because oh. I have real issues with my, and we don't want to get into this because it's just how old I am, but I need, <laughs> I need to have better posture. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I get that. I get that. I, uh, I mean, feel. When we have, we're writers, we have day jobs. And then we have to write after we get done with our computer day jobs. So we have neck issues. Yeah, I know, I know. This is a really good chair, but unfortunately it always makes me look like I'm lounging, which is probably why I like it, but no back pain, despite being you know in this chair for most of the year. That's good. Yeah um there, there's so much of this that's going to be edited out maybe <laughs> everything from the joke to how great my chair is <laughs> gone this ed interview is going to end up being like five minutes <laughs> <laughs> okay wait no i do have uh, a couple other questions i i want to ask um so many crime fiction writers write series your novels are standalones do you have any, is there, uh, do any of the characters recur? And if not, do you have any interest in doing a uh, series someday? I know you're a big fan of Murder, She Wrote for some reason. <laughs> um, no, I don't. I don't see myself as writing a series. Why not? I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, I, I don't have anything against it. I think they're awesome. And I think in some ways, it makes it easier if you have a world and characters set that you you know can keep building on as opposed to trying to invent new things every time um but i don't know i just never it's not something that i had an idea about that i think would be worth it pursuing at this point so i think it'd be so difficult right to for me i just keep thinking about like having to maintain interest in a certain character for so long just as a writer I have no problem reading series. I, I just yeah. think I would want to, I'd, I'd, I'd grow to loathe the character after <laughs> like four books. Yeah, I could see that. I like, I like what Tana French does where she, you know, she has this kind of series, but each, each one's a different, like she takes like a minor character from one book and makes them then the narrator and the major person. And she had this really, like the way she talks about it, I like, she's, you know, she said, I can't write a traditional series where there's like this one character that all this bad shit just keeps happening to, because like, that's just like, they'd be in a mental institution after a while if like all this stuff was happening. And so she wants to write about the character at the moment that like something massive happens in their life. And that like, that's like the case that changes them or like, somehow defines them and I really like that so I like the way she approaches it so if I was ever going to do something like that I could see that kind of approach but I don't know how people do it when they're you know when it's the same person yeah. who's solving small town murders all the time like so two questions before we get to the uh the uh writerly advice portion um what's been the best moment in your uh young writing career i don't i don't know how to answer that one it's really hard because i thought about i thought about like something and then i was like well no but that was really great and how, how do you i don't know like to me this is going to seem like a cop-out sorry but to me it's like 
I am con continuously astonished at the generosity of the people in our community, like the, the writers and the way that we help each other out. And like, you know, I'm at the point now where I'm sort of thinking about like, oh, I gotta ask people for blurbs for the, this next book. And it's like the worst thing to ask somebody because they're so, everybody's so busy, you know? And then you write to somebody and they immediately are like, absolutely, I'm so honored, thank you. And I'm like, really? <laughs> thank you. You're awesome. You know, and, and so it's like little things like that, where you're like, oh, like, you feel like you're a part of this. And like, people are just, I don't know, I know that's a cop out. But it's, it really is it's like the best part, I think about doing this, because there's so much as we will find when we move into our next segment, there's a lot of stuff about reading that's hard and sucks sometimes. And so I think the best part of it is like, just being surrounded by awesome people who are willing to help. Yeah, like, honestly, the reason why I have an agent is because of you, basically. So, there's no, yeah, you would have. I mean, if you didn't know me and you'd submit her, you would have had her anyways. I just, uh, I, I just, uh, I, yeah, it was all me. You're right. I don't take the praise. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, um, you know, you're, I, I don't disagree with you whatsoever. I, I remember, you know, one of the best moments I had, you know, my writing was after the unrepentant came out and I was at murdered mayhem in Chicago. And I was at the hotel bar with, uh, a, just a ton of writers, uh, Susie Calkins, Lori Raider day, that, that whole uh, Erica, uh, Neubauer, that whole Midwestern contingent, Jess Lowry. I mean, these were all people in the community and as writers that I greatly admire. Um, and I was, one of them it was so right. weird. it was the first time I really felt that you know it was I don't know why it was then because I'd been to you know tons of conferences and, and events and I, I knew right I know I knew a lot of writers but for some reason I I don't know what it was it just it felt like I was with true peers and yeah it was that that was the best uh just the best feeling and it was such a small moment you know but it was right it was so cool but it's like those small moments. Like I, I remember you were doing a talk recently with Jennifer Hillier and Andy Bartz and you guys oh, yeah. were talking and I was on and I was like, I did, I asked like a question or something like, cause it was not one of those ones where you could like see everyone who was on. And like, I put a question in the chat and you guys said something about it. And, and Andy was like, oh man, I just loved her book. I just loved one night gone. And I was like, she read my book. <laughs> I was like, I didn't even know she like knew who I was. So it's like moments like that where you're like, wow, like people who, you know, actually read my stuff. I don't know. It's just weird. So yeah. yeah. No, no, it, it's cool. It's it's really um you, we we talk a lot and we'll get to I guess this is a good segue about the crime fiction community and how supportive it is. And a lot of that you don't really, you know. It, it, it's nice. It's like kind of like having a good friend. You don't realize like the depth of friendship until you need that friend, you know, right. and that the crime fiction community, the, the, the people I know it anyways, and I, we know a lot of the same people are those, you know, if, if you need them, they're, they're there for you and they're willing to do what they can to help. And they, uh, yeah. and, and it's also like, I don't know, it's kind of an exciting time to be a writer yeah. right now. I mean, there's so many different paths in publishing and there's so many uh different voices and opportunities that i mean there's a lot about it that's dispiriting but i i don't know it it feels just a lot um a lot less uh cumbersome than it would have been maybe 30 40 years ago yeah i can see that i mean i think this past year has been tough because you know people aren't really visiting bookstores as much anymore. We can't go to events as much in person, conferences, you know, those sorts of things. And I miss that because there's something, I mean, it's nice to be able to do this kind of thing and not have to um, change out of your jogging pants, for example, or leave the house, but- Pants? Yeah. <laughs> there were those things that you used to wear before when you left the house. Oh, okay. Yeah, in the old days. Um, so I miss that. I miss that like in-person part of the writing thing, but you know, we'll get there again. 
Yeah, yeah, I I do too to an extent. I found I always found the weird thing is I always found conferences so tiring, and I'd come home after the weekend and after like BoucherCon, I remember telling Nancy like, "Ah, oh, man, I am beaten." She's like, "Oh, what'd you do?" And I was like, "Well." went to the bar and <laughs> <laughs> went to panels and I, I was in one and yeah, that's about it. And, but, you know, I don't know, it's something about, I, I, you know, they're, they're definitely memorable uh, experiences that I'm going to remember forever. You know, every, every conference for me has been significant in some way, but the, um, but there's also that, that sense of being on that is yes. kind of, kind of, exa- I feel like I'm being myself, but maybe I'm just like talking louder than normal or something. Cause I really am sort of tired at the end of it. I don't know why. Yeah. No, I get the same. Th- I mean, I also get very drained from zoom calls though, too. So what are you saying? I think it is just that nature of being on and um, I don't know. But I also feel like I've never gone to a conference and not left with like some new connection or yeah. some, you know, her- hearing about some new opportunity or something like that. And that's, that's always really cool. So. I'm always surprised that, you know, with panels, you know, a lot of the panels are about when they come to craft or about the same thing. You know, it's like the writing, writing bad characters, how far is too far, uh, you know, plotter or pants or that kind of stuff right and i kind of but when i go i almost always can pick up one one new thing yeah e- mm-hmm. even if it's just like a book suggestion to read or something like that but there's like one tip where i'm like oh i hadn't thought about that that's yeah. interesting or a different way to do it. i mean i don't i don't write take notes like some nerd or something but i uh so i don't i retain any of it but if i did wow <laughs> so helpful <laughs> Because okay. yeah. writers often have very good advice. That's my transition. Why? What a what a what an interesting point. So Tara and I have been hitting at is we decided for we wanted to do I, we wanted to do half a panel with an interview. Actually, Tara wanted to do less, but I was determined to talk and to talk about her an interviewer for at least half an hour. And then we wanted to do another half where it's kind of like a writer Q&A. We asked, uh, we did a survey, uh, a, a pretty scientific survey. I think we hired Ipsos, the research firm, or we posted a question on Facebook and asked um, writers what they'd wish they'd known before they started writing and or before they got published. And we uh, got a ton of really interesting answers that we thought we could alternately make fun of and um and discuss <laughs> so do you want to what do you how do you want to do it do you want to trade uh i printed out your google doc that she sent oh uh, nerd <laughs> um do we want to call people out or should yeah. we just oh about, we want to call people out oh, you yeah. call people out. all right well you have the printout so you're you're you can do that but what i wanted to say was i thought that it felt like to me like all the, the things that people were posting about like went into three different kinds of buckets, which I feel like we've what? talked about a lot, right? Oh, bucket. Buckets. <laughs> <laughs> Categories of yeah, right, information, right. which I feel like we've already touched on a lot of, but it seemed like a lot of it was about the realities of publishing and contracts and the amount of money that you really get and the work you put into it and all that and then there was like the business side of it right like I didn't know anything about contracts I don't know how to do that um and then they talked a lot about the community like we did suck-ups talking about how much they love their friends and then what was the third one I said Uh oh you're on mute what are you the narrator (laughs) yeah Oh, I know. It was about, it was about, um, it was about like the rejection side of it and like growing a thick skin. Right. And, 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 and taking criticism and taking rejection and growing as a writer because of it. Yeah. Those were the three like main categories that I saw. Yeah. So, yeah. So the first uh, one I wanted to touch on was from JJ Hensley who said, at best, 
you're probably going to make $2 per, actually, let me do it in the way JJ wrote it. At best, you're probably going to make $2 per book if you are traditionally published. Therefore, if you even sell 10,000 copies, you aren't quitting your day job. JJ Hensley, womp womp. <laughs> We made fun of him so bad. <laughs> <laughs> He's so poor. No, that's not it. Um, <laughs> he was just the first person who responded. He was so negative. We were like, but <laughs> really was. I was like, way to be a downer. This reminded me though. So I was on a panel once with a DC writer named uh, Neely Tucker, and who's a terrific mystery writer. And he um, talked about you know, let's say you get a hundred thousand dollar advance, you know, which is terrific, right? Or a hundred, you sign a contract for a hundred thousand um, dollars. He said, 15% of that right away goes to your agent, which is well-deserved, right? So you're down to 85,000. And then he said, and it's paid out, it's paid out over installments. So really, and you're probably only going to get it when you reach certain points, like the once the manuscript's accepted, once the, if it's for two books, maybe it's when the next book uh, manuscript is received and accepted by the publisher. So you're really, and that's probably over a two to three year period. And so you're really looking at maybe $20,000 a year, especially after taxes, takes a chunk of that out as well. So as good as it sounds, you're, and, and then you're not gonna get paid until you sell through that advance. Right. So you're not getting any, or not paid, you're not going to get any royalties. So it can be. Right. And um, then also, if you want to hire a publicist or do anything to promote your book, or if you need to pay for things like permissions. Yeah. If you have something in your book that's. So many like people don't realize. Song that, lyric or something. Yeah. So many people don't realize <clears throat> that that's what the advance is for. That it, it, you know, it's it's to pay for stuff like that, and a lot of times the writer is the one who gets those uh, clearances too, which surprised me. I did not know that. Right. I assumed there was like, I don't yeah. know, people in suits who made important people in suit type phone calls. <laughs> now, I think really, if anyone's going to take away anything from this interview, it is don't put song lyrics in your book. It's not worth it. We, we try, I know you and I both try and mention that in every panel we do. Every panel, <laughs> even if it's not about writing. Um, would you feel like, you know, one thing I always think about is I've, you and I have both had day jobs since we graduated uh, college. We never, I mean, even through kids and everything else, we worked straight through. Right. Do you, um, could you do it? Could you write full time, or do you need that that other stability, other sense of stability? I don't know. I mean, I, I think I could totally do it. Yes, yes. If I was able to financially, um, I could definitely do it uh, and be fine. But there is something to be said about having a like a job and a stable salary that comes in so that you're not relying on like being creative to to survive you know yeah like, I, mean, I feel like that allows you to be more like take risks or whatever in a way that if you were relying on like oh my gosh i need to get this book published or i need to write this article in order to get money it would be a different i think it would be a different feel i think the the hustling sense of professional writing yeah. is to me sort of depressive you know yeah. I don't want to I didn't get into this to write stuff I don't want to don't want to write yeah that's a much uh, better way of saying it is it yeah okay it's much more concise um, way of saying what I was trying to say so let me see did you have one you want to touch on or do you just want me to go down uh the list and pick out some or um yeah I don't my printer's broken so I wasn't able to print it out so you you could read them. Okay. Um, one that one I liked a lot was from Lindy Walker. She said, there's never an angle. The goalposts in this business move constantly. I woke up on my very first launch day and said to my husband, if 20 people I've never met buy my book and enjoy it, I've done what I set out, uh, I set out to do here. 
thousands of readers and uh, listen awards later, those goalposts just keep scooting further down the field. Yeah, I like that one too. And I think there's something in there. It's not quite what she was saying, but I do think that one of the things that I wish that I had known when I started out was that uh, the further along that you get, the problems just keep changing and the challenges just keep changing. You know, it's, it's like, I feel like I thought, well, if I could just get a short story published in a really awesome university journal, that would be it. Or, you know, then it was like, well, if I could just get a book, I mean, if I had a book, that would be it. And then it's like, well, now I just, I really want an agent. If I could get an agent, you know, and it just keeps like moving. And um, there's always somebody that's going to be more successful than you, that you wish you were. And then there's always going to be like, I feel like the further up you get the, like, like I don't know, the, the higher stakes there are to fail, which is scary, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree completely. I mean, one of the things that I, I wonder about is, you know, with these, these goalposts, I mean, there's so many writers, especially a lot of debuts who get like rock star advances and there's no way they're, they're going to sell through. Most, most writers don't really. I mean, and it's, I don't know if that's true. It just seems maybe it's just everybody I know, but I mean, a lot of writers do, but I just mean for those big, big advances for debuts, it's really chancy. It's risky. And yeah. I, you know, I, I wonder like, I don't think you should ever say no to the money, but um, it, it still seems like you're, you're setting up a, 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 a big challenge for a, for a debut writer. Those goalposts like are, way down the field all of a sudden right and i think that's kind of unfair for publishers you know to do to like set set up writers in that, that way um because you're right like no one's going to turn down that kind of advance um and so i think that there's there's more education i feel like that could be done for writers before they get an agent get a publisher sign a contract and I, I feel like MFA programs are a good place for those kinds of conversations to happen and they don't as much as they should. I really think that there should be more classes in MFA programs or in like, you know, writing centers that aren't necessarily focused on the craft of writing, but also the business of writing. I don't know, maybe that's gotten better since I went through my MFA program, but we never were really um, set up for that kind of knowledge. Well, there's a, a weird thing with MFA programs, right? Where, and I didn't go to an MFA. I just uh, lurked around them for a while. But it, you know, it, it seems like from the, the writing classes and instructors that I had and, and studied under, like, you know, they're, they're sort of teaching you not to write like, you know, they, they don't want you to, to, to write like, let's say someone like John Grisham. But the publishing world absolutely wants the next John Grisham. <laughs> it's very, you know, it, it, there's a, a disconnect there that I, I think leaves so many writers completely unprepared for the for the business side of, of writing. Definitely, yeah, I would agree with that. You know, one of the, one of the questions, or one of the one of the not questions, one of the notes we got was from Lisa Regan. I never know how to say her last name. Prada Rudy, Prada Rudy. I think it's Prada Rudy. Do you know how to say it? I don't. Mm -mm. Okay, we'll go with Prada Rudy. Um, Sorry, she Lisa. Talks about, <laughs> Sorry, Lisa. She talks about the extensive editing. And she said, I talked to a lot of newbie writers who are not at all prepared for the amount of editing involved once you start working with a publisher. You can't, you really can't be precious about anything in your book. No bad reviewer will ever skew, skewer you as painfully as a good editor. And yeah. that you muted yourself again. Yeah. That stuck out to me, especially after you mentioned the uh, second book and how your editor, um, uh, what you know, you you decided to go in a new direction. Was that was it hard for you to to realize? I mean, that that it was that it was constructive. No, I mean, I, I'm actually. Um, I, you know, I work as an editor for my day job or whatever. And um, so I have great appreciation for editors who can often see your work completely differently than you can. And I feel like if you have a good editor who knows what you're trying to do and has like a sense of who you are as a writer, then 
I don't know. I feel like I trust them implicitly. So I've never been like a precious person to be edited. Like I'm like, okay, whatever. I mean, it doesn't, it, I'm not going to say it doesn't hurt because when somebody says like, you need to cut the first hundred pages of this, cause it doesn't start till then or whatever. Like that's like, that sucks. And I, you know, go throw things and sulk for a day or two and get mad. And then I'm like, okay, you're right. Fine. I will sit down and do this. And then it's always better. So I, and like, once you get through the months and months of like line editing and, and copy editing, developmental editing that goes into a book by the end of it, I'm just like, fucking change whatever you want. (laughs) (laughs) Just please just, I don't want to look at it ever again. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. You know, like they'll get like a line, like, is this really the right word? Maybe. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Just put it in there. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) Well, there's a point where you're so, um, you know, your, your ears just get deaf to what you wrote. Like you you can't really see the, uh, it's, it's really, I mean, I, I, I'm like you, I really want the edits. I remember, uh, you know, I, I, I look for sort of the, the person who's really going to take me to task because if they're not, as long as they're not being unnecessarily cruel and, and I, you know, then, then more power to them. I, I want someone to read the best book out there, but at the, you know, at the end, yeah, you are, you're just so tired. You are, and you can't, you can't look, you can't see it anymore. Like I'm, I just sent my manuscript to a few beta readers just to kind of get a cold read because I'm like, I need somebody who has not been staring at this. Cause even my editor at this point is like, I'm too close to this. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's been really valuable to get that feedback of, you know, like this character, I don't understand what her backstory is. And I'm like, well, that's because I cut that scene five months ago in which the back scene, what the, you know, like the backstory wasn't there. And I, didn't realize that it's not there anymore. And so those kinds of um, cold reads are really helpful too, I think, when editing. So a writer we're both friends with, um, Hannah Mary McKinnon, uh, said she had a lot of uh, things she wished she'd learned. One of them, uh, be prepared to do a whole lot of marketing yourself, even if you're traditionally published. And yeah, with your, um, it does seem like, uh, <clears throat> like your publisher had a, really i mean they seem to take care of you they, they seem to do a really good job um uh you know getting your book out there to the right people the right reviewers um mm-hmm. getting in in the trade publications that you needed to be you didn't hire an outside publicist right that was just i did not no you, i thought about it oh go ahead go ahead no i did not i did not hire one um i have a i had an internal publicist at harley quinn who took care of a lot of media pitches and, um, you know, sending out the review copies and that sort of stuff. And they did a huge promotion on Instagram, like to bookstagrammers, um, they, who are awesome. Like that was really cool. Like just, I mean, your book's everywhere and these beautiful photos and it's really awesome. And they're such a great community of readers. Um, But I still think even so I had to do a lot. I mean, I set up, I think I set up all of my events um, they did hook me up with a couple of like interviews or, or, um, and helped with a little bit of placement of articles that I, you know, would write, uh, just as a way to like promotion, but I set up all my own interviews and, um, I mean, I'm sorry, events, like I my book launch and like all the bookstore events and things I did, I like set up myself. So I still think even if you're with a big five publisher, you have to still be out there as an author and, you know, willing to make connections and do events and engage with fans. You can't just be this like Ivy Tower lofty author out there who just produces books and sits back and watches them fly off the shelves. Like, I don't think that happens anymore. But that'd be so nice, right? Isn't that what- It'd be lovely. Yeah. (laughs) What about, um, so when do you think what do you? What are your thoughts on hiring uh, publicists then for a writer? Should they? I mean, is there? A, do you have any any thoughts about the necessity of that? I don't really know. I mean, I feel like you might actually be 
a better person to ask that because you have worked with outside publicists a few times. Um, so I feel like you would be better to, to talk about that because I, I don't really know. I mean, I haven't had any experience with it. I was in media relations as a job for a while. So I felt like, I don't know, not that I was really great at pitching myself or anything, but I just, to be honest, I don't know how much it moves the needle. Like, does it matter if you go on a blog tour? And I don't know, you know, or if you like, I don't know, write an article in Crime Reads or in, even in like the Washington Post, if you have an editorial there, like how many sales is that? Yeah. You know, tra translate into, and I don't really know. I mean, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And it's like, I feel like you have to balance the time of writing these things and pitching these things and doing these things versus what's the return on investment. Yeah, I mean, I, I really think it depends on the kind of events. I mean, if you can, one, one thing that I know that works, if you can read a poem during a presidential inauguration, it really helps yeah. your name. It really helps your books get out there. Yeah. That, if you can book that, then you might, you probably need a publicist. Yeah. I, um, well, no, but I also think like partnering with other writers like, especially if they're in different areas than you, like, you know, than your community and like doing like conversations with like authors who are similar to what you're doing. Like, I feel like that helps at least bring awareness to, you know, to a different kind of audience and stuff. So that's one thing I like. And plus it's not as awkward, you know, standing that as standing there by yourself in a yeah. bookstore and chatting about yourself or so. I think that's a nice trend that I see authors doing a lot. I would say for, you know, I, I have, like you mentioned, I have hired outside publicity for, uh, for my books and it, it can work if you go into it with, if you understand the expectations, so many writers are disappointed, but when I ask them what they expected, they're just like a bunch of sales. I'm like, yeah, I, no publicist can guarantee your book's going to sell. Nobody can guarantee that. I mean, there's nothing they can do unless they're buying it themselves and giving it to people. I mean, there's, <laughs> Um, there, there's so many other factors that go into that. For me, it was always about, I was fortunate enough to know that. And I was fortunate enough to work with somebody who, you know, wasn't obscenely expensive. Um, so my goals were, I thought somewhat modest, you know, I, yeah. I wanted to appear certain places. I wanted to expand sort of, uh, you know, my reach into different areas and markets. And so we went at it pretty surgically. Um, so I was, you know, able to hit those goals, but as far as, you know, did it help with sales? Did it, I think I, I really don't know, you know, I, I can't pinpoint it to that. I, and I don't think a lot of writers can, you know, unless you're self-published and you see the, the results immediately, otherwise right. you're going through publishers or other people to get, to get that kind of information. And it's, it's just hard to come. Yeah. To. I also think people, it's not only about sales, but I think also people expect if they hire a publicist that they'll, they'll end up in like parade magazine or yeah. um, real simple or, you know, like these like big national publications. And that's like super, super hard to get into. So I don't know. It's a tough question. So Hannah had one other, uh, or she had a few others, but one other one that I wanted to mention that you mentioned earlier, uh, writing books may not get easier, but trusting your process will. And you disagree. Do I disagree? <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that you've been struggling finding your process. Well, I feel like if I'm right, Hannah outlines every single book and knows every single thing that's gonna happen before she starts writing. So she might so, feel yeah. more in control of her process than I do. I, I just, I don't know. But I do think that maybe, maybe this is what I agree with with her is that you start to find out the kind of writer that you are, maybe, you know, maybe you get a little bit better at figuring out what your process is and like how to go about it without driving yourself insane. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, I've only written two novels now, so I don't know what the third one's going to be like, but it's, I don't know. I just feel like there's nothing that's guaranteed. And so you have to kind of celebrate the, 
all of the successes and the little tiny things that happen that are good. You know? I, I miss that. What? <laughs> <laughs> Give us your parting wisdom, Ed, as we wrap this up. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> this is the end of the date, huh? Uh, <laughs> I, um, yeah, I gotta go to the restroom. <laughs> never. <laughs> Um, so for me, if I was, if there was one thing, I guess, yeah, we should say what we wished we'd known. Um, for me, the importance of an agent, um, a good agent at that, because so we, like you mentioned, we have the same agent and Michelle's my second agent. Um, <clears throat> the first was, uh, what was somebody I was really just intimidated by. You know, I, I felt I, I, I was really green to, to publishing. I didn't have any connections. I all, I all I thought about was writing. I didn't think anything about publishing. So getting that first agent was really um, <clears throat> a bit, uh, it felt humbling to me, you know, and I, I didn't, um, I, I, I was too nervous to really be direct to her and to ask her about, you know, where my book was, what she, what she thought of certain things it, to get to really good insight. And I, you know, I, I wish that um, I, I'd been more assertive. I should have, you know, this is a really, it, it's a business relationship. It's also a partnership and you're both working towards the same goals and it doesn't serve you to be, uh, to, to be reserved when it comes to that kind of thing. So I would say, getting a good agent and also be, because there's also so much with the industry that you don't know. You know, I know so many, I, I know a lot of writers who were unagented and they're like, well, I'm an attorney, so I don't really need someone helping with the contract or, but, yeah. and that may be true to an extent, but you don't know what, what you're missing. You don't know what's not being included when it comes to, and when it comes to things like foreign rights or whatever, that, that can be very complicated. So that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think like, that, that 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 there's like some sort of um like experience type thing like so the idea that i published two short story collections with a small press and sort of had that experience of like what it's like to publish what it what like what the realities are of like the distribution and sales and events and all that stuff you're doing like i felt like that really helped me a lot when i did get an agent because my expectations were different like i had a sense of this is where I had been, this is where I want to go. Like I wasn't really, I wanted more than mm -hmm. what I'd had. Like I wanted to keep growing, but I also wasn't going into it thinking like, oh, I'm going to get this million dollar advance and everything's going to be amazing. Like I had somewhat lower <laughs> expectations than that. And so I feel like also there's something to be said about testing the waters, right? Like not just writing a novel and sending it to agents and like, that's your first experience. It's like, yeah. maybe write a couple short stories, you know, try to submit them to small press, like small pubs, try to submit them to online places, try to submit them to national distributed magazines and like kind of get those experiences so that you have a little bit more of an understanding of the way the business works before you like jump into it, so. And it also know. helps with your, CV when you're eventually trying to sell that novel to someone to have credits somewhere to have a, and to start building those relationships that later will be used to promote and uh, your your eventual novel. Yes, because they because editors want a platform. They want you to have a platform. We know so small. much. Yeah, we basically solve the world right? problems. Right Next, yeah. If anybody has any uh, legal or medical questions. We'd be happy to come back in 2022 and discuss those. <laughs> but I wanted to say thank you so much to everybody at Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival for having us here. Thank you so much to Kathleen Kelly for organizing this. She's such a champion of writers and uh, of crime fiction. And it's and this is, I think, my second year here. And it's uh, I, I just love this festival. It's just a little gem in Virginia. So and in the, in totally the country. Agree. So thank you. I totally agree. Thank you so much for having us. And um, 
we hope that we'll be able to return in person to the festival at some point. It would be great. Um, and if anybody has any questions, if people have made it this far <laughs> and they have questions for us or they want to follow up in some way, um, you could reach me um, through my website, www.taralaskowski.com. And your website is? Uh, eamar.com, E-A-Y-M-A-R.com. So thank you, thank you so much. Great to see you and talk to you again. Bye.